You're listening to Secret Sonics, a podcast exploring the creative side of music production. So welcome back to another episode of Secret Sonics. I am here today with my friend Jacob Gordstein, and this is going to be a bit of an interesting episode. We're going to dissect uh, one of our favorite albums and uh, just talk about what into what went into it, the production, what we love about it, um, what makes it such a monumentous record. And uh, yeah, welcome to the podcast, Jacob. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for coming out. I'm very glad to be here. We're sitting here today in my living room, and Jacob even schlepped in his... Uh, uh, what's the official word for it? Record player. His vinyl record player. That's true, yes. Uh, it's the late 60s. Uh, it's one of my record players. I have many. I'm sort of a vinyl fanatic. He's a vi- vinyl file. <laughs> yes, I like vinyl. Though I like to listen to it. I'm not an audiophile in any way, even though I am a sound engineer. This is a Garard, late 60s Garard 0S. 0100S, it's called. Uh, it's a lovely, lovely machine. It's very beautiful with uh, with its gold accents and everything. But I just figured the album we had in mind should be listened to on period-appropriate hardware on the original vinyl because um, that's just how it sounds best to me. So should we introduce the record that we've been listening to? Yes, we should. So you want to go for it? Of course. It's Revolver by The Beatles. That's a... Uh... Which came out in 1966. Yes, it did come out in 1966. And um, in my mind, it's like the, the second transformative record for the Beatles' career, you know? If I have to look at the Beatles' career like from a macro view, like from afar, then I'll, you have the early period, mm-hmm. which is up to including help in my mind. And then you have the two transitional records, which are Rubber Soul and Re- Revolver. Which uh, come together, one, one after the other. Yes, chronologically they, they speaking. came out pretty... Uh, well, they, they were basically... Back then, they were working on a schedule, right? They, were, they had a very rigid contract. They had to provide two 14-track albums a year, plus two singles uh, in between those that were not on the albums. Wow, that's rigorous. By the way, I should just I should just mention that Jacob is a is an unofficial uh, audio historian or music historian. Maybe he doesn't have a MB, like a master's or anything, but he but he knows enough to to be a historian. I'm not really a music historian. I know a lot about the Beatles because that was my childhood. I basically just um, I guess of of the music re- that both I, of I us dove love. really deep yeah. into into the Beatles yeah. stuff and yeah, a lot of the funk stuff and the soul stuff of the '60s and '70s that would also be an area ex- of expertise of mine. But you know, I know next to nothing about like a lot of really popular '70s rock bands, so I wouldn't okay specific. Music historical facts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In a way, yeah. We can niche it down. That's okay. That's, yeah, that, that's fine by me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so the Beatles macro view, we're talking about the... Right. Uh, and then you have like the later stuff, which is after they stopped, they, they stopped touring, which is Sgt. Pepper onwards, which is basically like each one of those records in my mind is an era all in itself especially when you're talking about production techniques and audio, like the sound of those records, you know, because they each have a very distinctive sound and they're very unlike one another. But as for like the, 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 the middle bit, right, the transitional records, which is Rubber Soul and Revolver, uh, sound-wise, um, they're actually kind of similar, I think, in a way, um, but Revolver definitely does have a very experimental edge that even Rubber Soul, you know, only hinted at slightly. Right. You know, it sh- was just a completely different ball game. I should point out real quick that the mm-hmm. Re- Revolver is the first record that was actually engineered by Jeff Emmerich. By Jeff right? Emmerich, that's even, true. Even, even, they are similar, I guess, stylistically. They're, they're similar ish records, but Revolver has a much edgier crunchier sound and yes it's also a much more in your face kind of sound because uh yeah. he liked to close mic everything and over compress stuff with the fairchild uh, that he had 
Um, yeah. He he used that um, that uh, that limiter to great effect on this record. It's very very like. A very busy kind of sound. It's a little bit on the edgy side, I'd say, you know, in terms of like harshness, it's a bit harsh. I think that, yeah. you know, uh, they were still like very limited by the equipment that they had and they were still searching for the the exact way to to EQ things in rock music in that mm-hmm. era. How many channels were the Beatles limited to in this era? In the, around Revolver? four, uh, uh, four, four. Same uh, they as Sergeant Pepper. They were using uh, four tracks for most of their career. Uh, only Abbey Road really was recorded an eight track. There were a couple of tracks from the White Album that were recorded an eight track as well. That were recording in, uh, that were recorded in Trident Studios. Not but, as to Abbey Road, uh, the yeah. staff, uh, but Abbey Road didn't install. An eight-track machine up until um, 1969. I think some of the the, the White Album stuff was also recorded in eight track. Come to think of it, but generally speaking, it's very. Um, yeah, they 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 already had the machine when the Beatles were recording Sgt. Pepper, according to um, to people who work there. It was just not installed yet. It was just sitting and waiting for them to <laughs> make the jump. You know, it's like wow. nowadays people are waiting to upgrade their machines, you know, like to yeah. a new version of the operating system or of their recording software. Like extra extra eight gigabytes of RAM or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're just, you know, you buy it and then you just sit on it until you're mentally ready to take on like the leap and to 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 have all your... You know, because people get so uh, set in their ways, yeah. you know, when working with yeah. equipment and you just want that familiarity and that quickness uh, of working. I'm not like that. I, you know, I like to, I like to try out the new thing right away. You know, every new, every new update that comes out, I'm the, the first guy to install it. I'm the one you're, who... You're an early adopter. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the one who, who will go with like a beta version of the software to like a recording yeah. session. Amazing. Uh, <laughs> it, My man. It, it has, it, you know, it, it, it didn't bite me yet, but it might at some point. Well, uh, we, we learn by taking risks, I guess, right? And take chances. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I'm I'm a pretty technical-minded person, I think, you know. So I'm good at uh, removing problems when they do crop up. So I I just trust myself the to audio not engineer. Yeah. Uh, to not lose my um, lose my head when I uh, when I do encounter a problem linked with my affinity of taking risks. Nice. <laughs> But generally speaking, I can sort of get you know the the Abbey Road engineers for not installing the the new equipment and the and the eight track uh, tape machine until pretty late in the game. Uh, but yeah, um, I think starting from from like Help, they had the four track, or maybe even maybe even Hard Day's Night. I'm not really sure. But the early stuff, you know, the overdubs were kind of limited anyway. They would basically just perfect a, uh, a backup track and then they would overdub their vocals. Maybe a guitar solo. Yeah, maybe a guitar solo here and there. But generally speaking, they only really started taking advantage of the studio a, a little bit during um, Rubber Soul and a lot more during Revolver. What, revolver what? was yeah. the point. The, the Revolver sessions started with Tomorrow Never Knows, which is the most momentous track on the album. And, and, the, the, and most, the final track on the album. And the final track on the album, but it was actually recorded first. We it's, haven't even listened to it together yet. We only listened to the first side yeah, so Yeah, we far. only listened to the first side so far. We yeah. thought we'd start talking about that. but uh, No, let's know, jump into it. It's good. Yes. Uh, well, you know the track. You know it. It is impossible for us in the twenty first century, with our ears completely dirty, by listening to complex music all the time, and sampled stuff, and you know all kinds of different sounds that come in to popular music. You know, it's impossible for us to. Uh, realize how big of an impact that one track had on the entire world of popular music then in 1966. 
which which it was sounded 53 like, years ago by the way yes it sounded <laughs> like nothing nothing else right. that was on the airwaves uh in that time and the complexity and uh and just the soundscape the amazing soundscape of that of that recording it was the first ever pop recording i think to use sampled samples basically right they they used tape loops because there was no such thing as a sampler then you know the mellotron existed that's you can you can call that a sampler and they did utilize it very much uh, you know a lot of it it was utilized on this record as well i think it was the first record they mm-hmm. actually used the wow. mellotron on some of the samples uh, that run behind uh, that run behind tomorrow never knows were sampled from the mellotron uh one of them is actually paul mccartney's laughter very speeded mm-hmm. and uh some of those are you know the seagull noises that was his laughter i think it was backwards and 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 faster wow and another you know there was an orchestral like chord that was used and there was um a guitar uh, bits of a guitar solo that were uh, that were very speeded and just uh, and dropped do do do. in yes exactly so uh, yeah that was that was an amazing achievement that song all by itself and then basically that set the tone i think for the for the entirety of those sessions well wow. um, could, could you talk a little bit about how tomorrow never knows came to be what it started with what yes, was, it started the with the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Uh, that was um, and Timothy Leary's book about it. Uh, John Lennon uh, used to go into um, uh, you know Paul McCartney had this uh, had this guy that he knew who was part of like a, a group of um, of guys who liked experimental stuff in London, and he his connection to that world was through Peter Asher who was in that group with, uh, with those guys. He liked all that kind of stuff. And um, his girlfriend at the time was Jane Asher. Right. And he was living in their house. And um, Miles something, I forgot his last name. It escapes me right now. That's why I'm not an actual historian. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you, are, uh, you are for me. <laughs> uh, he, um, he had like a little bookshop in London with all kinds of hippie stuff. Uh, it wasn't called hippie stuff back then. Hippie was not a term yet coined. You know, it was just starting to come in. But uh, that's, the, uh, that's where John Lennon found this book by Timothy Leary. And literally the first words in that book when you open the, 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 the front cover were turn off your mind, relax, and flow downstream. Mm-hmm. And basically, that was the beginning of... So he ripped the lyrics from the book. Yeah, he, he ripped a lyric from the book, yes. Uh, I don't think it was exactly like that, actually. I think mm-hmm. I'm, uh, I'm exaggerating the, the exactness of it. Mm-hmm. I think... Uh, it might have been paraphrased. Yeah, it, was, it, it might have been paraphrased, but it, but it is from that book, yes. And he got really into that, um, you know, uh, philosophy kind of um, kind of view of of life in general. And he wrote that uh, that song around those feelings. But the basically that was the lyrics and the song itself. What he was trying to do, he was trying to capture the sensations of an acid trip mm-hmm. in music. He wanted to create the perfect piece of music to go with an acid trip. So who came up with the looping? Uh... Paul McCartney uh, came up with the loops. He, came, he brought in the loops uh, into the studio. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were basically the entire track. So were... we all sampled music basically to Paul McCartney in that sense. <laughs> in a way, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. It's a very like I don't know who of them uh, which one of them maybe it was George Martin who who suggested the idea that they would connect you know a bunch of tape machines to the console and use the console as a musical instrument wow uh I don't know you know nobody really can say you know there, there are differing accounts on about whose idea that was, was originally what, no. Paul McCartney was fiddling with loops you know he was experimenting with loops in his own home 
right? So the loops that he brought.